الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى أما بعد My dear brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Our discussion today is The Journey to the Next Life Part 2 which is The Life in the Grave. Our first part was Death and this is Part 2 The Life in Grave. So let us begin our discussion with the first question what is the life in the grave? We find that answer in Holy Quran. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeeb I'm seeking refuge in Allah from the cursed shaitan. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Beginning in the name of Allah, the kind, the merciful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Barzakh is in front of them until the day when they are raised up. So in this verse we see two main elements. One is Barzakh and then the next part says when is the Barzakh? The first part say Barzakh and second part say the time frame of the Barzakh. So before we say what is Barzakh, let us see the time frame mentioned in this verse. The time frame is Allah says Barzakh is in front of them. I mean when they die, Barzakh begin. And then the Barzakh continues until the day of resurrection. So we find the time frame from the, for the Barzakh is it begins from the death and then it ends at the resurrection. So what is Barzakh? The Arabic word barzakh means a partition. So suppose this is a partition. And this partition is separating this side from that side. So this is the partition. This side is this life and then this partition is another life which is barzakh. And then after this partition, next life, the life hereafter. So Barzakh is another stage of life which is in between the death and the resurrection. Death and the resurrection. How long it is? Only Allah knows. We don't have the accurate idea how long it is going to be. But it is a stage of life, inevitable. Each and every human soul must go through it. So Barzakh is partition. It's like between this life and the life hereafter, it is a waiting period, interim period. What is the waiting period for? Why people have to wait for? People have to wait for the day of resurrection, the day of judgment, 
and that day of judgment will be a grand gathering all the mankind from the first man Adam until the last man who will come in this earth all the human being will be gathered in that great great grand gathering so people who die now or who is going to die later later all of them have to wait for few things the first thing they have to wait for the entire human change to be ended we discussed in our last discussion that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created all the souls at once and then kept the souls in a world called al marwah and from that world the souls are coming in this world to join the human body and then Allah knows that when the last soul will come that means how long this chain is going to continue so it might take a while then the human being whoever there they have to die then rest of the creature creations they have to die then the world structure now that has to be destroyed to prepare another world for that grand gathering then the angel particularly responsible for the trumpet he will blow the trumpet and then each and every human being will come out from the ground for that grand gathering the day of judgment so we can see in this journey process there is a after death and until the resurrection there is a waiting period and that waiting period is called Barzakh and I'm calling it the life in the grave because most of the people are buried in the grave but you may ask a question that what about people who are not buried in the grave some people are cremated some people are drowned in the sea some people are torn into pieces with a bomb blast or something so what is going to happen with them well Barzakh even though I'm calling it the life in the grave because most of the people are buried in the grave but it is a stage of life it is a time frame and that time frame that stage is for each and every soul doesn't matter how they die but each and every soul must go through that process must go through that stage Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make that happen for each and every soul so our question was what is the life in the grave the answer is Arabic in Arabic it is called Barzakh in English I'm calling a stage of life or the life in the grave now we come to second question the life in the grave is it real or is it just a theory we strongly believe it is real because whatever Holy Quran talks about is real the divine knowledge the knowledge from all-knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is real so it got to be real let us go through few verses from Holy Quran that indicates about the life after death and most particularly the life between death and resurrection 
which we call Barzakh or the life in the grave. The first verse it is talking about the people who do not believe in the next life. As soon as they die, the wheel will be taken off. They will see everything. They will come face to face with the reality. And as soon as they will see the reality, then what would be their reaction? What would they say? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed in Holy Quran what will be their remark. Some people will die on wrong faith. When they are on wrong faith, death will come to one of them. And then that person will see the truth. That person will see the reality. And then that person will say, قَالَ رَبِّ رِجِعُونَ That person will say, Oh my Lord, please send me back to the life again. Oh my Lord, now I can see the reality. Now I can see what is the truth. Now I have no doubt about it. So please, Send me back to life again. Give me a second chance. Then I will have proper faith. And I will be ready for this life. And I will come back with full preparation. Oh Lord, send me back. So that I can work, I may work rightfully the thing I neglected. That will be the reaction. So this verse proves that soon after the death, people will see the reality. And that reality is another life, Barzakh, the life in the grave. If we look at another verse, that verse talks about three stages of life. The first stage is this life. The second stage is the life in the grave, Barzakh. And the third stage is after the Barzakh, day of judgment, and then hereafter. And unfortunately, some people will be punished and humiliated in those three stages. For example, hypocrites. So Holy Quran talks about the three stages of life. <laughs> we shall punish those hypocrites twice. First time in this life and second time in Barzakh, in the life of grape. Then third time, And third time, also they shall be sent to a painful penalty. So this verse also proves about the life in the grave or barzakh. Let us check with another verse from Holy Quran. That verse also talks about some people will be punished in the barzakh life, the life in the grave, 
and also the full punishment will be after the judgment in hereafter. Example, Farouk and his groups, because of their atrocity, corruption, and his groups, they actively associated with him and supported him in corruption. Holy Quran describes and severe punishment captured the Pharaoh's group. Severe punishment soon after their death captured the Pharaoh's group. What kind of punishment? Holy Quran says again. They are exposed to fire morning and evening daily. So that means while they are in the grave, their grave is connected with the hellfire so that daily morning and evening they will be exposed to the fire but that is not the full punishment this is like before the real punishment this is like a detention center and detention itself is one kind of punishment but lighter compared to the actual punishment So that kind of exposure morning and evening to the hellfire will be in the grave life. Then the next stage Allah says When the day will be established when the judgment will be done then the full punishment will be given Angels will be commanded to push the Pharaoh's group into the severe punishment. So that will happen after the grave life, after the barzakh. So from these verses of Quran we can see that the life in the grave is not a theory but it is real and this real information is coming from the all-knowing almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the third question is how can one feel comfort or discomfort after the death in grave Most particularly people who don't believe in next life, for them it is very hard to digest that how come we die and then after the death we are not supposed to feel anything. But you are talking about another life where people will feel punish, punishment or they will feel comfort or joy. How is it possible? How is it possible? It is not very difficult to understand. If someone wants to understand, wants to look for the reason, wants to think about it, wants to ponder about it, then there are plenty of signs available. Allah Rabbul Alamin says, Inna fi dhalika la ayak li qawmin yatafakkaroon Surely there are signs for those who think there are signs. Now the question is what would be one simple sign available in front of us that explain our question that explain what we are asking for how can one feel 
comfort or discomfort after the death how it is possible well one simple sign is our sleep and our dream during the sleep when we dream we dream happy things or we dream nightmares comfortable things joyful things or very painful things full of sufferings just look at an example suppose you are dreaming you are chased by a tiger you are terrified you are sweating in your dream you are screaming help 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 you are running for your life but no one comes then you are exhausted running 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 cannot go any faster but the tiger is chasing you with full speed then tiger grabs you put you down and then penetrates it teeth into your body how do you feel you feel painful you are screaming in your dream you see you are bleeding you are crying for help you feel you are like dying how is it possible the next person sleeping beside you will stand up in the court and will say i am sorry in the name of god i did not see any tiger i did not see him running but you are saying no 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 i was running and i felt pain it is true we feel pain but how not physically when we die our body perishes when we sleep also soul goes out and in the last discussion i said the sleep is the small death that happens every day so in our dream whatever we experience is our nightmare or happy dreams we experience not through our physical body we experience through our soul and similarly when we die our body and soul get separated so body perishes but the soul takes the imprint of our personality the soul takes our moral or immoral our behavior our habit all the imprints of those things with it and then in the grave life until the day of resurrection for good righteous people this grave life become life a comfortable place before people get the actual award they are given nice accommodation food and entertainment entertainment facilities and for the criminals before the actual punishment they go through a detention center so this grave life become either a deten detention center or a comfort zone for people and they experience either punishment or they experience comfort through the soul so the question was how can one feel comfort or discomfort after the death in grave the answer is they experience it through the soul exactly as we experience fe fear or or courage during our dream through our soul let me conclude the answer with a verse from holy quran the verse indicates that 
in the day of judgment, day of resurrection, after soon after the grave life, when some people will wake up, they will call the grave life as a dream in sleep. Holy Quran describes and when the trumpet shall be sounded then you will see men from the grave will come quickly forward to their Lord when the trumpet will be sounded each and every human being they will come up to the grain gathering and when they will come up it is not their choice like the death is not their choice it is Allah's choice Allah will decide when and how one should die and similarly Allah will decide already Allah has a pre-plan then exactly what time that trumpet will be sounded and people will rise up so it is not people's choice it is Allah's choice so people will come out from the ground and then particularly people who did not believe in those things in this life they will be confused they will be bewildered and they will rub their face and they will say out of their confusion they will say Qalu ya wailana man ba'athana min marqadina They will say Asuru to us who has raised us up from our dream in sleep So they will say that their grave life was like a dream whatever they experienced there it was like a dream and truly because the grave life only soul in our actions as I said that goes as an imprint with the soul only those two things stay in the grave life not physical body but when people will raise up again they will be raised up with body and the soul again. So that is the answer that how can we feel comfort or dis discomfort after the death in grief. It will be like a dream state. Question 4. Is it a loss? Is it a loss when Muslim lose a loved ones? Is it a loss? As far as our belief concerned, it is not a loss. It depends on our perception about the reality. Our perception about the reality Sometimes we have a wrong perception about reality and sometimes we have true perception about the reality. And depending on the perception, we feel either loss, loser or gainer. So let me give you one simple example. Suppose you are a happy family. And a member of your family has a job with a rich company. What would be a rich company? Say for example, gold company. And the company likes him so much because he contributes a lot. So company decides to make a house for this employee on top of the Kashmir hill a beautiful house 
house is built nice furniture and other things has been put there and the house is built with gorgeous looks so from that bungalow he could see the entire city when the house is built then time comes time comes that your family member needs to shift from your house to that house so he does shifting you lose few tears few drops of tears because you are going to miss him before you used to see him every day now you will see him every now and then maybe so from shifting shifting from your house to the kashmir hill a better house do you think it is a loss no you don't similarly muslim believes that this life is a house and then when they go into the grave that is also another house but if we practice well here then the grave become a better house more comfortable house because in this life we are in the exam period as soon as we die exam is over then time comes to get the benefit started so muslim thinks it is a shifting from one house to another better house that's why they don't think it is a loss but you may ask a question here if muslim don't think it is a loss then why do they cry people cry because of the emotional bond but that does not mean that they think it is a loss the cry because of the emotional bond it is obvious it is a part of human being even though if we suddenly get 5 million dollars we get excited and we become overwhelming and we we can cry emotion is part of human being that's why people cry but muslims never cry because they think it is a loss look at the term what a muslim say when he or she hears whether his loved ones or another muslim has passed away what do they say they say inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun to allah we belong and truly to him is our return in other words as soon as a muslim here a loved one is passed away then quickly he or she says that that person had come from allah subhanahu wa taala in this life in this temporary house came from allah subhanahu wa taala and then the time is up now the person is returning to allah subhanahu wa taala so what's the worry what's the loss about it when a muslim maintain that sort of faith and attitude then allah rabbul alamin promise that allah will give them even more more benefit for this patience and control according to a hadith hazrat abu musa radiyallahu ta'ala narrates rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that when a loved one is passed away for example a child then allah rabbul alamin ask the angel of death o oh, angel of death have you taken away my servants most precious and most beloved child here is child but in general anyone who is very much beloved 
Allah Rabbul Alameen asks the death of angel and death of angel say yes ya Allah I have taken you well loved ones from your servant then Allah ask again what did my servant say about it what was his or her reaction about it was he angry was he depressed was he cursing angel said ya Allah your servant didn't do any of those things rather your servant praised you and recited inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun to allah we belong and truly to him is our return your servant had patience then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say to other angels, the two angels, for this patience and for this praising. In the situation of grief, my servant has praised me and for that reason build a house for him or her in the paradise and name the house Baitul Hamd, house or praise, house of praise, name the house for him, give the name of the house, house of praise or Baitul Hamd. So that sort of information makes one very sure that Muslim, even when they lose someone very dear, they don't lose. As long as they maintain the patience, as long as they follow the code, the teaching of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and they remain in control, they they maintain their patience, then they gain more and more and more. Not only that, even for a little help. If someone is passed away, then organizing the funeral service, going to the Zanaza prayer, going to the burial, praying for this person, making dua for this person, organizing food for the family, passing the news to one another, all these things, little or big, any kind of help, also brings lots of benefit, no loss lots of benefit. Ibn Masood radiallahu ta'ala anhu narrated that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said Dawud alayhi wa sallam asked O merciful Allah what is the reward for a Muslim who participates in the funeral of another Muslim? It was revealed to him from Allah Rabbul Alameen, O Dawood alayhi salam. The reward is, I will give you, I will give that person, that Muslim, two special rewards for the participation in the funeral service. I will give two special rewards. One reward is, when this person will die, then lots and lots of angels will participate in his funeral service. This is one reward. And another reward is, I will bestow my special mercy on my servants after he dies. So we can see that as far as Muslim concerned, losing someone dear actually is not a loss. It brings heaps of gains. Losing someone means we lose, but we hand it over under the care of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Take care of that person in the grave 
with the benefit of paradise inshallah in this discussion we are going to find that out later on the fifth question is how the soul see and responds during funeral process how the soul can see and response during the funeral process so we said in our previous discussion we said that when people die angel takes their soul out and if the soul if the person is rituous believer then the soul is taken above the seventh heaven to a place to a paradise called Illyin to register the soul there and then they return the soul in this earth so when the person will be buried then angel will put the soul in the body so that person can sit up for questioning for the unrighteous person the soul is taken down to the earth in a place called Sijin to register there and then brought it back and put it into the body when the person is buried if the person is cremated or drowned the same process take place as we have mentioned earlier so until the soul is put back into the body the soul stays where with the angel According to Bakor ibn Abdullah radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he says that the soul stays at the hand of the angel of death. And the soul can see the washing, the clothing, the rest of the funeral service. He said if the soul could speak, then it would forbid people from mourning and screaming. So the soul sits on the hand of angel of death and can hear what other people are saying. Hazrat Anas <coughs> radiallahu ta'ala anhu narrated that after the Badr battle, after the Badr battle, Huzur Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was talking to the dead bodies of the enemies. He was telling them, O oh, children of so and so, aren't you finding it true what Allah Rabbul Alameen had promised to you? I'm finding it true what Allah has promised. But are you finding Allah's promise about the barzakh, about the grave life, about the punishment in the stage? Are you finding it true? Whatever Allah Rabbul Alamin has promised. Listening to that lecture. Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala said, Ya Rasulallah, why are you wasting your talk with the dead bodies that have no souls in it? Rasul sallallahu alayhi sallam said, Umar, they can listen to me, they can hear me more clearer than you, but they cannot return my they cannot, they cannot, 
they do not have the ability to answer me but they can hear so the soul can hear everything we say the soul even realize what is lying ahead if the person is righteous then the soul realize that the grave life is going to be a happy place a comfortable place if the soul is a sinner if, if the person is a sinner then soul realize it the danger is going to become ahead if we see another hadith narrated by abu said khudri radiyallahu ta'ala anhu rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam said when people carry the dead body if the person is righteous then it says to the carriers please hurry up please carry me faster carry me faster and put me in the grave why are you going to slow because the righteous person feels the soul realizes that comfort is lying ahead the hadith continues but if the person is a sinner then it says to the carrier unlucky me where are you taking me where are you taking me the soul become restless and scream with scar and say where are you taking me and every creature can hear the screaming except human and jinn human and jinn they do not hear why because there is a bill if they hear these things if they see these things then there is no point of testing them if people could hear the screaming of sinners they would have screamed terribly as well out of fear the soul also offer piece of advice to the people around the funeral hazrat umar radiyallahu ta'ala anhu narrated that rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam said soon after three steps taken by the carriers the soul say to the people around oh my brothers oh the carriers be careful let not the world deceive you the way it has deceived me let not the life keep you busy with fun and game as it has kept me busy oh my brothers listen to me i worked very hard in my life i earned so much in whatever i saved from my earning i left it for my families for my next generation but today i am not enjoying those things because when i died i i died with empty handed today my all my savings and earnings are being enjoyed by my family yet i i am the one who has to give full account for every penny to allah rabbul alamin in the day of judgment people have to give account how they have earned and how they have spent how they have earned and how they have spent even though we earn we worked hard but when we die we don't enjoy other enjoy but we have to give account so that's what the soul says to the carriers and the people around that this is what going to happen to you as well so be careful so we can see from some examples how the soul can hear can talk 
can feel everything but cannot express through mouth, cannot use the vocal cord because of the death of the physical sight. The irony is, after death, one can see more, hear more than before the death. Before death, people have will on due to exam purpose. But soon after death, that will is taken off. After death, the soul hears and sees how differently angels and humans give importance on different, different things. Angels give importance on the basis of the reality they see, the perception they have about the reality, and human beings give importance based on the perception they have about the reality. I'll just mention one hadith, how two different beings think differently. Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala narrates that Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, in the funeral, angel walks with funeral in front of the crowd and they ask one another. They ask one another about the dead person. They say that what kind of good deeds this person has done for the life hereafter. Because to them, the reality is the life hereafter and only good deeds is helpful there. Not money, not bank balance, not big building, not a big car, nothing. Only actions, good actions. So angel know and they see the reality and based on that reality they become worried about that person that how much good did he has done. On the other hand, people who go there, most of them, most of them, according to the Hadith, they ask each other that what kind of wealth and how much money this person has left behind for us. Because the perception of most people here is wrong because they don't see the reality. So their perception is money is everything. That's why as soon as the family member dies, some people they start fighting about the share. How much do I get? How much do I get? Alas, they don't know or they don't see the reality or they don't remember the reality that the most beloved person who has passed away he is facing the different reality. If he has good deeds, that will help him. Or people who are now alive, if they have good actions, that will help them. But no, they are mostly worried about this world and the selfish reasons. So our question was how the soul see and responds during funeral process. The answer is that soul can see everything, can hear everything and can offer advice for the people around as well. Question number six. What sort of questions people face in the grave? We mentioned earlier that when people are buried in the grave, or if they are cremated after the cremation, then say for example after the cremation with Allah's order the every pieces of burnt ashes put together to make the body and then angel put the soul in the body so they are made sit up. 
if the body is buried then the angel put the soul into the body and then asks the body to sit up so the body become alive and then they sit up for questioning for questioning our question is that what kind of questions people face in the grave before I answer that let me mention that who are going to be the questioning officers Hazrat Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala narrates Rasul sallallahu alayhi sallam said after the placing of dead body in the grave two angels with blue eyes and dark color they come there two angels and one his name is Munkar and the other one his name is Nakir so two angels are the questioning officers Munkar and Nakir they come in this hadith they come with a terrible appearance but other hadiths they come with nice appearance why depending on people's faith and their action Munkar Nakir can come with a pleasant appearance or can come in a terrible appearance now the question is what kind of question do they ask let us find out the answer from a hadith Hazrat Bara ibn Azim radiallahu ta'ala anhu narrates Rasul sallallahu alayhi sallam said in the grave two angels come to a believer two angels Munkar and Nakir come to a believer and ask him or her who is your Lord that would be the first question the believer replies my Lord is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then they ask what is your religion the believer replies my religion is Islam then they ask again pointing to me Rasul sallallahu alayhi sallam is saying that angel will bring his picture and show it him an angel will ask the believer that who is this person who was sent among you the believer will answer he is Muhammad Rasulullah then angel will ask how did you know about him because you were not born even in then how did you know about him the believer will reply I have read in holy divine book in holy book and I believed in him and I supported him then an announcement will be made from the heaven the announcement will be my servant has told the truth the same way the angels Ask a disbeliever the same question according to the hadith, but he or she says, Alas, I don't know the answer. Because of their different faith, they won't be able to answer. According to the hadith, then the announcement will be made from the heaven that this person has told a lie. So from this hadith we can see what kind of question is going to be. Munkar and Nakir will ask about who is true God, what is true religion, who is true messenger of Allah and what is true divine book. Now who can answer these questions properly? I'm talking about Muslims now. 
any Muslim might say, I might say, not a problem. I can memorize these questions and answers and I'll be through in that exam period. But that is not the case. The case is different. I'll give you an example. Suppose you and I and many of us, we want to go to a job interview and two examiners are going to handle the Bai Babusi. In that Bai Babusi what happens? Despite the knowledge and qualifications, some candidates they become nervous. And when they are nervous, they make a mess. They are not able to give correct answers. Similarly, similarly, when Munkar and Nakir will ask question in the grave, Muslims with weak practice, Muslims with weak faith, they will not be able to answer properly. It is not entirely on Muslim that they can guarantee for the correct answer. They can make an effort. They should make an effort. They should practice all the way possible. But ultimately, it depends on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whether to give that Muslim ability to answer properly or not. Holy Quran describes that if a Muslim is a true faithful, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help him or her. يثبت الله الذين آمنوا بالقول السابت في الحياة الدنيا وفي الآخرة Those who have true faith Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps them on قول السابت Those who have true faith True faith means not only the lip service, true faith means believing in it and also bringing it, bringing the faith into, into practice. That is called true faith. Allah Rabbul Alameen will help those who have true faith, true faith practice. Allah will help them on Qawl Sabit. Qawli sabit min on the on their word of faith. Fid fil hayat al dunya wa fil akhirah on the word of their faith. Allah will keep them on their word of faith in this world and the akhirah in the next life. In grave life is the first stage of next life. So they are also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help the true Muslim to give the answer properly. Question 7. What will be a result in grave for true or false answers? We have mentioned before that some people will be able to answer properly and some people won't be able to answer properly. So what would be the result? Let us find out from a hadith what would be the result. The result of true answer. Hazrat Bara ibn Azib radiallahu ta'ala narrates Rasul sallallahu alayhi sallam said after the correct answer from a true believer Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will command the angels that bring a bed a special bed from paradise for my servant in the grave bring proper dress 
for my servant from paradise. And then open the door of paradise and make a link, a connection between the paradise and the grave so that my servant can enjoy the comfort of paradise partly being on the grave until the day of resurrection. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders to expand the grave as big as the servant can see. So the grave become a comfort place, comfortable place for the successful candidates. Until the resurrection, they enjoy the comfort there. No punishment for them if they are lucky. On the other hand, the result of false answers, the same narrator narrates that Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, who give the wrong answers, angel receives order from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, bring a bed for this servant from the hell, bring the dress for this person from the hell, and don't expand the grave, rather close it. Make it narrow, as much narrow as two sides come together, so that one side of the ribs will enter into another side of the ribs. And the hadith goes on. There could be so many kinds of punishment depending on the degree of sin and in this short brief discussion it is impossible for me to mention all kinds of punishment that has been described in hadiths. The point here is that the life in the grief, the life in the grief is comfortable for some people or full of punishment for some other people depending on their faith and action. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us and all the human beings from punishment. Question number eight. What can help Muslims to face Munkar and Nakir successfully? What can help Muslims to face Munkar and Nakir successfully in the grave life? We all know that success never come without hard work. For success, one good to make some effort. So some recommendations here I'm going to mention according to Hadith. That these, if we practice those recommendations, then inshallah, the question if, or questioning of Munkar Nakir should be easier for us. One recommendation is, our first recommendation is that when Muslim place a Muslim into the grave, after placing it after the burial, then they should not leave immediately. They should make a special supplication for this dead person. And that supplication should be about, O oh Allah, give this Muslim strong faith and ability to be able to answer the question of Munkar and Nakir properly. We see that in a hadith. 
Hazrat Usman radiallahu talanhu narrates that Rasul sallallahu alayhi sallam used to finish the burial and he used to stand up and he used to tell all others who ever attended he used to tell them oh people listen to me seek Allah's forgiveness and make supplication for your brother or sister who is in the grave. Make supplication so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep him or her strong faith intact against the question if questioning of angels. Because right now the angels are questioning the person in the grave. So the first recommendation is don't leave immediately after the burial make a special supplication another recommendation is talqin some ulama say talqin talqin mean calling and reminding the dead person after the burial after the burial call the dead person from his or her head side and remind the person O oh son or daughter of so and so say now say to the angel that I am happy as Allah my Rob I am happy as Islam is my religion I am happy that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi sallam is messenger of Allah I am happy as Kaaba is my Qibla I am happy as the Quran is my Imam and so and so. So make talqeen. Call the dead person and remind the person after the burial. So that is second recommendation. The third recommendation is according to another hadith. After the burial, recite. They are recite the first few verses of Surat al-Baqarah beginning from Alif Lam Mim Thalika al-Kitab la rayba fi hudan lil-muttaqeen until Ulaika ala hudan min Rabbihim wa ulaika humul muflihun So this verse from the beginning and then with same surah surah Baqarah last few verses from surah al-Baqarah starting from Amana al-Rasul bima unzila ilayhi min rabbihi wal mu'minun until the end of the surah so that is third recommendation the fourth recommendation is we can practice something every day Ibn Masood radiallahu ta'ala anhu narrates whoever recites surah tabarak alladhi once every night tabarak alladhi biyadihi al-mulk wa huwa ala kulli shay'in qadir this surah the name is surah mulk whoever recites surah tabarak alladhi once every night will get relief from the punishment in the grave. He continues narrating. He also said that whoever recites regularly a bars from Surah Yasin Inni amantu bi rabbikum fasma'oon Inni amantu bi rabbikum fasma'oon This verse Whoever recites this verse regularly 
the questioning of munkar and nakir will be easier for that person so this recommendation is recite sura mulk every night and then recite regularly inni amantu bi rabbikum fasmaun this is a bars from sura yasin the fifth recommendation is be very regular in five times salat in time because salat is also going to be helpful there hazrat zabair radhiyallahu ta'ala no narrates that rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam said when a true believer is buried and he or she is made to sit up for questionings to him or her it seems that the sun is going to set soon so he or she needs to perform masur salat look the habit of salat is going to come up in the grave as well then he or she rubs the eyes as if just woke from the sleep and then says to the angels leave me alone and let me perform my asr salat so salat quran recitation dua supplications all these things are going to be helpful to face the question of munkar and nakir so these are just few recommendations the point is we got to study more and we should practice more Question nine: What would be the first and least punishment for some Muslims in grave? So we are talking about punishment for Muslims. If Muslims neglect their duty in this life. they will face punishment in the grave the degree of punishment may vary but the first punishment would be rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that the first and lightest punishment for believer would be both sides of the grave put pressure and they will come together even a space even a space for a for a hair won't be available there due to this pressure of grave the body the bones of dead person will be torn into pieces companion asked ya rasul allah pressure of grief is it for every muslims he sallallahu alaihi wasallam said yes so this is one of this very scary listening to that companions began to cry and said what would happen to us ya rasul allah what would happen to us as you won't be present for our burial and that pressure of grave is true because we can see that in hadith after the burial of hazrat saad ibn muaz radiyallahu ta'ala anhu his grave became narrow he was a companion of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he was a very high class very high graded companion very righteous prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was there he could see what others could not see so as soon as he saw that was happening 
then prophet sallallahu sallam made a special supplication to allah that oh allah save muas from this pressure allah rabbul alamin forgave him also we find from hadith that for for what kind of mistake muas radiyallahu ta'ala anhu was punished in the grave for what kind of mistake his mistake was time to time he used to mistreat his wife time to time he used to mistreat his wife the beautiful thing about hadith and prophet in his companion's life is they did not keep anything secret or hidden their strength or weaknesses they left those things for us for the million billion trillion followers to learn from their mistakes they did not hide anything they were human being as well to our is human human make mistakes companions of rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam they were human being but allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made them a vehicle for learning for rest of the believers so that from their mistake we can learn some was radiyallahu ta'ala anhu he was in trouble in the grave because time to time he used to mistreat his wife so little or big misbehavior we have we can face the consequences in the grave as well in another narration companion asked ya rasul allah please pray for the forgiveness for our punishment in the grave right then jibril alayhi salam came angel jibril came with the message and said ya rasul allah o messenger of allah let your companions know and let your all followers know if they want to be saved from the pressure in the grave then they have to practice they have to perform two rakat special salat every friday night every friday night they have to practice two rakat special salat in first rakat surah fatiha in the ayatul kursi ones allah la ilaha illa huwa al hayyul qayyum and then until the end of this verse ayatul kursi surah fatiha ones ayatul kursi ones and then surah zilzal three times iza zilzalatil ard zilzalaha so first rakat fatiha ayat al kursi surah zilzal three times second rakat same after two rakat salat they should recite a supplication 100 times and that supplication is allahumma inni أعوذ بك من عذاب القبر لا إله إلا أنت I will repeat again اللهم إني أعوذ بك من عذاب القبر لا إله إلا أنت So Jibreel alayhi salam said ya Rasulullah let your companion know let your follower know if they can practice two rakat salat in 100 times this dua every friday night then inshallah allah rabbul alamin will forgive them 
from the punishment in the grave. If any Muslim has to be punished in the grave, then what is the first thing happen? Angel come and turn their face away from Qibla, from Kaaba. Because whenever Muslim buried, you notice that their face is put towards the Qibla, towards the Kaaba. So angel come and turn the face away. Turn the face away. And then whatever punishment they need to go through, they go through. Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala no narrates that seven kind of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, seven kind of Muslims. Seven kind of Muslims. Their face will be turned around from Qibla because of their seven kind of bad habits. So what are those? The first one is a Muslim who drink alcohol. Because alcohol is prohibited for them, for them, but if he one keeps drinking alcohol, then could face the punishment. Second bad habit is who trades a Muslim who trades human another human for money. So some people they traffic children, sell human being for money, for business. That is also a very dangerous thing that that kind of Muslim will be punished in the grave. The third bad habit is a Muslim who gives false witness. False witness. Because of a false witness, so many bad things happen, so much bad consequences, and it is a punishable trait, we can say. The fourth bad habit is who takes interest, interest in riba, who uses the money to take advantage from the borrowers. Then the fifth bad habit is a woman, a Muslim lady, if she loses some loved ones, then she becomes out of control in her mourning and, and then she doesn't have patience. That is also a punishable trait. Sixth bad habit is a Muslim who in his business stores good, stores goods for excessive profit. Some business people, they, when the crisis come in the market, they store the goods and then they create an artificial scarcity or crisis and then overnight they put the price up to make money. Lots of people are doing this sort of things in, in petrol market today. Something has happened somewhere else. It is not necessarily going to affect the oil market here. But they could wait for 24 hours maybe or 48 hours to see that that problem is gone. But now they take the advantage and put the petrol price, price up. So for a Muslim, according to this hadith, unless it is absolutely necessary, unless it is fair, it is fair if, if the business is to exploit the customers, then for that reason, punishment will be in the grave. The seventh bad habit is, if a Muslim deliberately, intentionally, without any reason, does not perform Salat in congregation. So these are some bad habits according to this Hadith. That does not mean that only these bad habits will warrant 
punishment in the grave. I am mentioning, I am touching the things as briefly as possible. And the teaching for me and for the listeners is, we got to study more. We got to study more and find out and learn more bad habits that can bring punishment in our grave life. So, so that we can prepare ourselves in a better way and we can avoid those punishments by avoiding those bad habits in this life. Question 10. Oh, before I finish this, I should mention one hadith about the punishment in the grave, most particularly the pressure of the grave for Muslims. If some Muslims have to go through this, it is very scary. But there is a good news. According to this hadith, Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha asked the Holy Prophet Ya Rasulallah This hadith has been narrated by Sayyid ibn Musayib radiallahu ta'ala anha Aisha Siddhaqa radiallahu ta'ala anha Prophet's wife she asked Holy Prophet, O oh, Messenger of Allah, I am feeling very uncomfortable for your scary description about Munkar and Akir and the pressure of grave. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Aisha, don't be worried. The sound of Munkar and Nakir to a believers will be as easy as the sound of putting the eyeliners on eyebrows. It will be so soothing. For a genuine believer, a practicing believer, for he moha Munkar and Nakir should not be a things for worry. And Pressure of grave will be as little painful as mother push baby's head very, very gently. So that's a piece of good news. But that does not come easy. It requires strong faith and practice as well. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive our sins and save us from grave punishment. Now we can go to question 10. Question 10 is, who will accompany the dead person in grave? Who will be the partner there? Ayatah radiallahu ta'ala narrates, the only thing from this world will accompany the dead person in grave is his or her actions, his or her deeds, either good deeds or sinful deeds. Only that thing will accompany. In the grave, when the dead person will see the deed, the dead person will ask the deed, where is my family today? How come no one is here today with me? Where is my friends today? Where are my relatives today? How come they are not with me here today? The deed will reply, You have left all of them behind you. I am only your company. Then dead person will say, Ah, it would have been best for me to focus on you only in my life. I have focused so much with, with my family, with my relatives, but I would, should have been most careful about my actions, what I did, what I thought, how I behaved, what was my manner, on those sort of things. 
the dead person will say, I can see one, I can see today. No one else is my real company except you accept my day. The question is, how the deed will appear to the dead person so that the dead person can ask it? And when it will appear? The answer is, the deeds, Amal in Arabic, the deeds will come after the questioning of the angels. The deed will come as a person, it will appear as a person, according to one narration. For righteous believers, deed will come as a well-dressed beautiful person and will enter into the grave and will greet the dead person with Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Dead person will ask, I can't recognize you. Who are you? I have never seen a beautiful person like you before. Who are you? In reply, the dead will say, that person will say, I am the good deed that you had done in your life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent me to give you comfort and company in your grave. I shall be with you in the grave until the resurrection. On the other hand, for sinners, an ugly, terrible looking person will come in the grave. And then the dead person will be scared and will ask that person, Who are you? Why have you come here? I have never seen an ugly, terrible person like you in my entire life. In reply, he will say, I am your sinful actions that you had done in your worldly life. Allah Rabbul Alameen has sent me to give you discomfort and accompany you and I shall be with you in your grave until the day of resurrection. So that we can see after death our body perishes but two things never perishes. One is our soul and another is our action, our behavior, our achievement in this life, in this exam period. Question 11. How can, how can we make the grave a happy home for us? How can Muslims make their grave a happy happy home for them. Can we make our grave happy now? Can we make sure that our grave life is going to be a happy home? Yes, we can. According to a hadith, ad dunya u mazra'atul akhira This life is the cultivation period for the next life. So if we sow a good seed today, then tomorrow we will enjoy the fruits of that tree. And it goes vice versa. For bed, we will enjoy the bed. Nothing comes and goes without any consequences. So if we can make some special effort in this life to turn our grave into a happy home we have the choice now we have the chance and opportunity now let me go through 
some recommendations according to some hadiths generally faith in good actions is the key for our grave life or for our total next life journey but on top of that we can make some special efforts particularly for making our grave into a happy home inshallah so according to hadith rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam advised abu zar radiyallahu ta'ala anhu to collect two means most particularly for the grave two means one of those is rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam advised that observe fasting frequently in summer days observe fasting frequently in summer days why in summer days because summer days are very hard to observe fasting so if we can observe fasting for the sake of allah in hard time then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will look after us in the hard time in the grave another suggestion rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam gave to abu zar radiyallahu ta'ala anhu that when people are sleeping in the dark night they are enjoying the comfort of the bed you get up and perform two rakat special prayer so you will sacrifice your comfort to pray two rakat special prayer in dark night and pray to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for your grave in return allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make your grave comfortable rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam said abu zar if you can practice the two these two things by that your fear of loneliness in grave will be removed your fear of loneliness in grave will be removed by this to particular practice another hadith hazrat ali radiyallahu ta'ala anhu narrates if someone recites the following supplication 100 times daily will gain three things if someone recites the following tasbih 100 times daily will follow will gain three things and one of those things is he or she won't suffer in grief from loneliness so what is that tasbih la ilaha illa allahul malikul haqqul mubin i'll repeat again tasbih is لا اله الا الله الملك الحق المبين 100 times daily in other hadith hazrat qab radiyallahu ta'ala anhu said it was revealed on musa alayhi salam 